Litigation Help. My name is Heather Wiglitzwin, and joining me here are family law professionals Laura Garcia and Eva De Gia Marino. Laura is a family mediator and Eva is a family lawyer. Both have appeared in previous videos on this channel on mediation. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. So um, in this video, um, we're going to talk about the different styles of mediation that are available. Um, so now when I first learned about mediation, I, 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 I thought there was only one way to go about mediation. And then it turns out um, that there are several, several styles, I guess, um, of mediation out there. So um, maybe I'll start with Eva. Um, can you explain to us, um, sort of like, give us the basics, like what, what um, styles of mediation are out there? Sure. So I think you're talking about interests and positions, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, these are kind of the fundamentals about mediation that mediators usually learn about. Um, so oftentimes the participants of mediation don't really know about them, but they're really important important to know um, because once you have your head wrapped around these two concepts um, you're more likely to be more successful in mediation so a position is kind of like what you can consider a demand i want fifty thousand dollars that's a that's a position right an interest is the reason why that's underlying the position i want fifty thousand dollars because i need to buy a new apartment because we're splitting up and that's going to be my down payment. Mm -hmm. And my, the down payment I need is 50000 So my position is I need $50,000. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is because we've broken up, me and my partner, and I need to put a down payment on a new place. And I need $50,000 for the new place. Once you understand the reason why, the interest under someone's position, you have a better opportunity of coming up with really creative examples in a mediation that can meet the interest. So sometimes the position of $50,000 can move around if you still meet the interest. The interest here is the person has to move away and they need a down payment. Does it have to be $50,000 in one shot? Does it have to be $50,000 total? Maybe up for discussion. So that's an example. Hmm. Laura, do you have anything to add? Yes, uh, I, and I think uh, Eva eloquently uh, described the, the substance, so what, what families or parties in a mediation focus on. Um, and then there is uh, the process. So the process that applies into the, to, to deal with the substance, with, the, with these issues, with the positions or the interests, which can, um, can be a facilitative process or a facilitative type style of mediation. Mm -hmm. It could be an evaluative style of mediation where the mediator takes a little bit of more a, of a direct uh, sort of um, stance uh, in, uh, in the process. And it could be a transformative mediation, which has a very different um, uh, objective than, uh, than evaluative and facilitative. So there are a few mediation styles of media processes out there that deal with the substance um, at the table that uh, Eva has, uh, has expressed. Um, I think I understand the facilitative one, which is kind of like, I think what Eva already said. Um, when it comes to the evaluative, is, is that kind of like when a settlement conference judge kind of says, well, you guys better settle or, <laughs> or you know, you're going to lose kind of thing. Um, is it kind of like, it, would that be an example of an evaluative type of um, mediation? Or am I wrong? Yeah. No. I was going to say that's one example, okay. right, is, is that the mediator or the person in between the parties, so your example was a settlement conference where there's a judge in court that yeah. takes on that role of being evaluative of the both parties' positions. In the mediation context, it, was, it would be the mediator who has that style or who's taking that approach. Mm -hmm. And essentially what they're doing is they're not making a decision for either party, but they're providing their opinion, their professional opinion in evaluating maybe who has the stronger case if the case were to go to court or who has a stronger position based on the you know the context so for example if someone is saying well I want to pick up my kids at midnight every night and the other party is saying well that's really late and you know children of this age should go to bed at 8 p.m. right mm -hmm. an evaluative mediator might say yes for this age group 
you know, an 8 p.m. bedtime is better for their mental health, right? Um, so that's an example of a, how a mediator can help the negotiation by being evaluative um, and bringing in their own knowledge. So my next question would be, um, how, how would you know which style is the best for your situation? Is, is that something that maybe you should discuss with a, a mediator you engage with? Uh, like how do people go about like, or, or yeah, how would you know? Which, so which style should you pick? <laughs> um, I think it, it, it depends on the issue on, uh, of, um, uh, in, in dispute or that needs some kind of a resolution. But, um, uh, and also, I mean, I, I, think that, I think that there's reputations that follow certain mediators out there. Um, so it, it may just be a simple question um, in, in that field, in that circle, in that network, you know, who is more evaluative, who's more facilitative, who's more mm -hmm. transformative, what kind of styles and, uh, and approaches they, uh, they take. But I would also be cautious about that because um, I strongly believe that a, a, a well-equipped mediator doesn't only focus on only one, uh, one style. It's always going to blend the styles in order to apply for, to the family's needs in that circumstance. And the needs may change and they may change in that same moment or the next moment, right? So at some point they may need an evaluative approach on a particular issue, such as Eva's example, but at some other point, they may need you know, a transformative style where the mediator is helping them understand each other's interests and needs and focus on that in order to come to a resolution. So there's a, there's a difference in, in how, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm not sure how you would ask the question of the mediator and if the mediator would even, be uh -huh. able to answer that I only do evaluative, right? Because the reality is it may be completely highly inappropriate right. to do evaluative. For example, if it's a mental health issue and you're a lawyer and you're providing some kind of an opinion, which is completely outside of your, you know, your scope and your, your realm of knowledge and education, right? So that, right, so that those, those yeah. are, um, those are so the, the differences. I think there's a blend that's. Mm -hmm. Oh, that makes so much sense, right? So, so for example, if I were to hire you, you guys, uh, as my mediation team, um, uh, I'm, I'm sure I don't even have to ask that question because you would apply whatever style right. is the most appropriate. So that's not even um, something I, uh, as a client, I really need to be worried about. Okay. I, I, I think, uh, uh, and worry may be, may be a strong word in there because I think there has to be some kind of alignment with your mediator, right? So regardless of their styles, you have the right to feel comfortable with their approach, whatever, whatever that approach is labeled in the field or in a professional body, by a professional body, you have the right to feel aligned with the approach of a mediator. And if you don't, you can terminate the mediation. It is a voluntary mm -hmm. process. And I think that's very empowering and that's very important for uh, families to know because sometimes we do hear sometimes, we have, we have families who come to us and say, uh, you know, I had no idea that I can choose my mediator. A mediator was just appointed to me. I showed up in this room and I really felt uncomfortable with this person. I didn't feel that, you know, she heard me or he heard me. Right. I didn't feel that he was working for me. Um, I felt that there's a bias. I felt that, you know, going in circles. So that's the concern that I think a client should uh, address first and foremost is, do I get along? What's the approach? Describe me the process, right? So describe me in detail the process of your mediation rather than how are you going to, you know, are you going to be evaluative? Are you going to be transformative? Uh, just tell me how you're going to approach, you know, this particular scenario, right? So have a little bit of a, an in-depth sort of interview-like, <laughs> you know, uh, connection with the, with the mediator first. 
And so just now when you said that, uh, you know, if you don't feel that the mediator is acting appropriately or, or, or if they kind of said to you, well, yeah, I'm, you know, it's going to be interest-based, you know, and it's got a win-win and all this stuff. And then you go into the mediation and it turns out that they're extremely evaluative, for example. Right. You can turn right. the you can terminate the session, whereas you can't fire a judge, <laughs> for example, right. you know, that, that's it, you know, you get the judge, but the a mediator, um, even uh, this third neutral party, um, you are, the parties have the power in the mediation is so much more um, uh, party friendly, I think. Um, yeah, and I think on that point, Heather, you know, you mentioned that sometimes um, people that go to mediation sometimes have a different review, right, or experience. Yes. And I think that's because um, whether you have a facilitative mediator or an evaluative mediator or a good blend, a mediator that, uh, that applies a good blend of both, right. there's still subjective elements, right? So, you know, you can say, well, you know, or Laura and I try to facilitate a co-mediation, which is what we practice for our clients. So in facilitating it, we try to create the space that, you know, supports them and provides them with the information they need, but that may not work for a specific person, right? right. Even though we're trying, we try to facilitate it. They right. may need other constraints. They may need, for example, maybe they can't meet online and we're doing online mediations right now. So we can't right. facilitate an in-person mediation right or maybe they need um to do the mediation with a with, with their companion right mm -hmm. in the mediation and maybe that's something that me and laura would try to facilitate or maybe we wouldn't right depending on on the context mm -hmm. so you know that's a, that's an example and just like with evaluation there may be a mediator that is evaluative that's giving their opinion and uh you may not agree with it a party may not agree with it right and that's okay Right. right. It doesn't mean that uh, the mediator is wrong or the even the evaluation was wrong. Right. Um, it just means that it may need to be tweaked a little bit more depending on the party's needs. So it is a lot more complex than just, you know, what the labels may seem. Because uh, some of my clients who approached me, um, they felt that they were put under a lot of pressure both from their lawyer and the, and the mediator to accept some kind of solution on the table. Now, do you have the right as a party to just say, you know what? Yeah, I know that you guys all feel that this is the right solution, but I don't agree. Like, I just don't feel like I could accept the solution. Are you allowed to just walk away and say, guys, I'm sorry, like, you know, we tried this mediation, but I don't want to agree to the settlement. Are you allowed to do that? Of course you are. And I think this is where we spend a lot of time, um, Eva and I, and also in our, uh, in, in some of the public sessions to remind families that they are in control of that process. We are there to facilitate the process, but they are in control of the process. And in fact, they are in control of their relationship with their lawyer as well. Mm -hmm. So they can even if the advice is a particular advice, they can also say, no, thank you. I'm not going to take that advice. I am just going to go with what I feel is going to help me sleep at night. So, and that's very important for them to know. And it's very important. Uh, we make a, a critical point of addressing this right from the onset and tell families uh, and couples separately when we meet them separately in the beginning mm -hmm. that the last thing we want them to do is agree to something that doesn't sit well with them because okay. then the agreement that they're going to sign off on is at risk it's vulnerable it's a risk of collapsing in six nine months from now when you know things are gonna you know calm down a little bit more mm -hmm. so this is why we don't want them to make a decision we would rather them say i no longer will continue with the mediation and engage mm -hmm. different supports than to agree to something that they will for sure resent or collapse because it's not it's uh it, 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 they they don't feel they had agency they don't feel like they were there participating um and so therefore you know no ownership really accountability for the decision well, that is really good to know because i think that when the parties truly feel that the the agreement works that's the strength of the mm -hmm. agreement 
Yeah, great. Okay, so thank you very much for this uh, really um, uh, important um, information about the different styles of mediation. And thanks to everyone for watching. If you found this video helpful, please support us by giving us a like uh, and sharing it with others. And also don't forget to subscribe. Um, thank you, Eva. And thank you, Laura, so much again for coming back to our channel. Thank you. <laughs>